Good evening. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the inaugural lecture of the 2016-2017 Humanities on the Edge speaker series. I am Jeanette Eileen Jones, Associate Professor of History and Ethnic Studies and the lead organizer of this academic year series on post-racial feature, uh, futures. Our series features four amazing scholars whose scholarship invites us to consider the ways in which race has shaped our past, operates in our present, and will continue to shape our future if we do not interrogate the limitations and promises of post-racial ideologies. Before I talk about tonight's speaker, let me tell you a little bit about Humanities on the Edge. It was created by my colleagues and co-organizers, Marco Abel, who's in the back, chair of the English department and professor of English and Film Studies, and Roland Bakeshaw, who's over there, associate professor of English, and they created this in 2010. I joined the organizing team in 2011. This year, we welcome to our organizing team Carrie Morgan, there she is, um, curator of academic programs at the Sheldon Museum of Art. Each year, we select a special topic for the series and invite our speakers to address it through their specific disciplinary expertise. For year seven, we selected post-racial futures in response to the increasingly visibility of race in U.S. national and international public discourses. In the U.S. context, folks were quick to declare that we were living in a post-racial moment because we have a black biracial president. But as Obama ran a nation supposedly in a post-racial present, or at least on the cusp of a post-racial future, vigilante and police killings of unarmed black men, women, and children garnered attention and launched the Black Lives Matter movement. Concurrently, the war on terror exacerbated racialized Islamophobia in the U.S. and across Europe. Responses to the so-called Syrian crisis is a current manifestation of this discourse. The ongoing racialized debate over immigration in the United States continues to divide the nation as people imagine the pejorative illegal alien as a Latino rapist, drug dealer, or welfare seeker. Race is all around us, and we are going to talk about that. Is that okay with you? Uh, well, if not, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Race is all around us. So we sought scholars who can speak to the inability of many post-racial theorists to recognize and grapple with post-racial racism. As described by legal scholar Ian F. Haney Lopez in his 2010 article for California Law Review. Lopez called on scholars to interrogate and challenge post-racial discourses, calls for post-racial futures, and images of post-racial societies, particularly those that refuse to acknowledge racism as a systemic and structural violence that forecloses such post-racial possibilities. Let me repeat, as a systemic and structural violence, which is to say that this is not a matter of some bad actors such as rural cops and vigilante killers whom we can blame for the current troubles, but something wider and more pervasive. To that end, we secured Milton S.F. Curry, Sue J. Kim, Alexandra DaCosta, and Kirsten Buick as speakers for this year. If you will, permit me a modest preview of what is to come for this academic year. Of course, tonight we are excited to have Milton S.F. Curry, Associate Dean of Academic Strategic Initiatives and Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Michigan, who will be speaking on racial afterimages of architecture ideology. A more proper introduction is shortly forthcoming. After Milton's visit on October 13, 2016, same place, same time, Sue J. Kim, Professor of English and co-director of the Center for Asian American Studies, and Nancy K. Donahue, endowed professor in the arts at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, will deliver her lecture, Postmodern Fatigue, Post-Racial <coughs> Fallacies. She will discuss how postmodernism continues to inform how we think about race. In particular, what she calls otherness postmodernism 
is the tendency to privilege and celebrate difference, heterogeneity, and multiplicity by ignoring or even exacerbating institutional racial hierarchies in the US and globally. She will unpack the fallacies of post-racial ideologies and their links to postmodernism. Next year, on March 2nd, 2017, same time, same place, Alexander da Costa, assistant professor of theoretical, cultural, and international studies and education at the University of Alberta in Canada, will present towards hemisphere, a hemispheric critique of the post-racial. He knows how much academic analysis and activist critique of practices deemed post-racial come out of the history and experience of the United States. His talk takes a broader historical and spatial perspective on the post-racial to ask, what can we learn and do about hemispheric racial formations through an analysis that draws together expressions of post-racial thought and discourse from diverse locations in the Americas? In what ways does viewing the post-racial hemispherically allow us to not only identify and understand its various permutations, but also perhaps to forge solidarity across related place-based struggles against racism and white supremacy? On April 13, 2017, same time, same place, Kirsten Buick, professor of art history at the University of New Mexico, will present her talk, Slavery Makes the Woman, Historical and Racial Linkages in the Creative Practices of Mary, Mary and Monia Lewis and Kara Walker. Buick argues that artistic interpretations of slavery have varied, have varied little over time especially those representations by African-American women. Edmonia Lewis, who lived from 1845 to 1907, and Kara Walker, who's a current artist, um, she was born in 1969, garnered great fame because of their presumed association with enslavement and the reaffirmation of that association through their artwork. Buick's talk will explore the national and international fascination with representations of slavery. We need only think about films and series that have been made over the last five or six years. And how two black women ably negotiated that fascination to be, become both producers and products of race. So we're very excited about this lineup and we hope that you will join us for the other talks. So let me thank our supporters and sponsors. It takes collaborations to put on humanities programming these days, as you know. Without the generous support of the departments of English, history, sociology, teaching, learning, and teacher education, modern languages and literature, the Institute for Ethnic Studies, Women and Gender Studies, African and African American Studies, Latina, Latino, and Latin American Studies, the College of Architecture, the Sheldon Museum of Art, the LGBTQA Resource Center, UNL's Faculty Senate, and UNL's Research Council, we would not be able to bring our speakers to UNL. We also want to thank Anthony Hawley for once again coming up with a superb design for our posters and postcards. NET Radio for allowing us to promote our events on their Friday Live at the Mill show, and also the Watershed Blog Collective, a group of graduate students who run an independent blog of critical theory at watershedblog.com. Since starting the blog two years ago, they have published many excellent blog posts on various topics. Please read what they posted about Dr. Curry, Professor Curry, as well as blog our guest work in our lecture events. I also want to thank, um, especially for working with me, Jamie Brunton and Dylan Rockford, they're over there, um, who work with me on the funding. So please join me in giving a big round of applause to our supporters. So now is the time to take out your cell phones, and only now. If you're on Facebook, please like our page, Humanities on the Edge. And follow our Twitter, Twitter handle, at UNL Hot E, H-O-T-E. So it's capital H-O-T, capital E, UNL H-O-T-E. Feel free to tweet and post during this lecture. Now finally, let's talk about tonight's speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Milton S.F. Curry. Professor Curry earned his bachelor degree of arch architecture in what? You want me to say? It doesn't matter. 1988 from Cornell University, Department of Archi 
architecture and was an Alpha Rho Pi medal recipient. He then went on to earn his master's in architecture two, which is a post-professional degree with distinction in 1992 from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. He was appointed associate dean and associate professor of the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Ur Urban Planning in 2010. Excuse me. He was appointed associate um, Professor, excuse me, I said that backwards. He was appointed associate for previously, excuse me. He was appointed associate professor of architecture um, in Cornell University in 2002, and he also was an assistant press professor at Cornell from 1995 to 2002, and was director of the Cornell Council for the Arts. Um, he also taught at the Harvard Graduate School of Design two different times in 1991 and 1999 and at Arizona State University's Department of Architecture from 1992 to 1995. And it was in 1995 that he um, launched his own creative design practice, Arvid MCA Design Studio. That's all one word. Um, and in 2005, he consolidated his creative activities into Milton Curry, two separate words, Project Studio, one word. Um, and so he's been working in the field, but also he is a faculty member and has um, done great things, not only at the University of Michigan, but in partnership with other universities. One of the things I want to talk about is his editor-in-chief role of Critical Productive, I left the book down there, sorry, um, which is a double-blind blind, peer-reviewed journal, which is focused on architecture, urbanism, and cultural theory. And briefly, he also co-founded and co-edited Appendix, which is also another uh, double-blind peer-reviewed journal focused on cultural theory and architecture. His writings, his books, journal editing, exhibitions, creative work, and lectures engage multiple disciplines in public. So even though he's an architecture um, professor, he speaks across disciplines, and he um, gives lectures to various different groups. And that's why we invited him as part of our Humanities on the Edge speaker series. Um, he's won a lot of awards, and um, one of them I want to highlight um, and is a one point and over, excuse me, one point five million dollar um, grant that he raised since 2010 at the University of Michigan um, to raise the profile of Towson College, and he works with faculty and academic leadership to develop robust post-professional degree offerings in technology, health, and conservation. So let me talk a little bit about a personal note and how I came to um, know Milton's work and why I was keen on inviting him. Um, I was first introduced to his work by my colleague and friend, Joy Castro, who is the director of the Institute for Ethnic Studies. Um, and I started reading um, Critical Productive. And I have to say that this is important work that I was not familiar with. I mean, I knew people worked on race and architecture, but I had not read scholarly work on that. Um, and I was really riveted by the pieces that were included in the 2011 piece um, edition, but as, as others as well. And so what I like about Milton is that he asked us to understand architecture as not just a practice, but an intellectual project, which he's going to talk about today. How we need to understand um, urban renewal, urban revitalization, and gentrification. So all I can say is I have nothing but love for his work. Um, and I hope that you will after you hear him today. So please help me in welcoming our 26th Humanities on the Edge speaker, Professor Milton S. F. Curry. Tonight. Um, 
You know, in light of the unfortunate circumstances in um, Tulsa and Charlotte, mm -hmm. and the importance of these, uh, the importance of these kinds of forums uh, cannot be underestimated. Um, whoever, whoever, whomever the next president is, they will have to confront many of the topics that will surface uh, in my talk. And the question is, you know, how will they approach urban issues, and will we learn from the past? Um, and we can talk more about that Q and A. So I'm a political junkie. So, <laughs> um, so what is racial after images of architectural ideology, and what does it have to do with the humanities on the edge, post-racial, post-racial futures thing? The current landscape of discourse in architecture, urbanism, and urban planning has become wrapped up in the tension, one could say, between aesthetics on the one hand and rights on the other. The defined term in architecture of social practice, not unlike triple bottom line and social return on investment, seeks to exoticize what should be normative. And it is this impulse that I'd like to explore this evening and why contemporary liberal notions of multiculturalism and inclusion, important public policy and educational initiatives, may be masking more important work needed, particularly in black studies and architecture theory. Now, I explore two problems, uh, two problem cases I'm calling them this evening. One is the problem case of black cities, and the second is the problem case of architecture theory itself in service of a production of what I'm calling an architecture race theory, as well as a space of interrogation of black aesthetics and the integration of aesthetics into a revitalized notion of black studies. First, uh, the problem case of black cities. I'm going to start with two quotes. Um, your trivia buff, you can see if you can determine who, who the first quote is mm -hmm. from before I tell you. The neighborhoods of our cities, torn by the disturbances of last spring and before, still bear the marks of violence and destruction. Little rehabilitation or reconstruction has taken place. Months, and in some cases, years have passed. Months of planning, argument, and frustration. But the wreckage of the riots remains. Fire scarred, boarded up buildings, vacant retail stores, and rubble strewn vacant lots. This is the overwhelming evidence of a survey recently undertaken by Secretary George Romney, at my request, of those cities which have suffered riot damage. More than 20 cities were surveyed. The 10 with the worst remaining damage are Newark, Baltimore, Washington, Boston, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Kansas City, and Los Angeles. I have directed Secretary Romney to a similar program designed to initiate and coordinate prompt federal, state, local, and private action as many as 20 cities. I have made funds available to do so. That was Richard Nixon, President Richard Nixon in 1969. Now another quote. As a society, we choose to disinvest, to underinvest in decent schools. We allow poverty to fester so that entire neighborhoods offer no prospect for gainful employment. We refuse to fund drug treatment and mental health programs. We flood communities with so many guns that it is easier for a teenage boy to buy a, block, a Glock than it is uh, to get his hands on a computer or even a book. And then we tell the police, you're a social worker, you're the parent, you're the teacher, you're the drug counselor. We tell them to keep those neighborhoods in check at all costs and do so without causing any political blowback or inconvenience. Don't make a mistake that might disturb our own peace of mind, and then we feign surprise when periodically the tensions boil over. That's President Barack Obama in his remarks at the memorial service for the Dallas police officers in July 2016. The problem of black people in the American city continues to be a vexed cycle of segregation, disinvestment, evolutions of urban and suburban sprawl, rebellion, and social unrest, social protest, and so on. President Obama, responding to the aggregate violence from over two years of videotaped and mediated images of outright killings of black <laughs> Americans in Baltimore, New York, Ferguson, Florida, and elsewhere, throws the blame onto society at large. In his 1960 remarks at Forest Hills,
President Nixon lamented the massive redistribution of purchasing power through the transfer of wealth to the suburbs and the problems of multi-jurisdictional governance given the proliferation of new political districts. He described the difficulty of city housing and the need for holistic policies to address large-scale urban development and emphasized the metropolitan region as the focus of innovative solutions. In 1969, in the wake of numerous riots in 1968 and 1969, Nixon announced programs for rehabilitation of urban areas damaged by riots. In 1973, he devoted his entire State of the Union speech, entitled Part Message on Quality of Life in Cities and Towns. In it, he pronounced the American city largely on a comeback from rampant crime and substandard living conditions. More importantly, he lamented the plight of the government's money spent on urban, urban renewal and public housing. He said, quote, I recently learned of a city where $30 million was paid for an urban renewal project. But instead of getting better, the physical condition of the target neighborhood actually got worse. In one of our huge high-rise public housing projects, less than one-third of the tenants are now fit for human inhabitation, and less than one-fifth are even occupied. In another city, urban renewal was supposed to salvage and improve existing housing. $30 million was spent over 12 years, but the results were so meager that the planners finally gave up and called in the bulldozers. Now almost half of the project's 200 acres lie vacant and unsold. That was Richard Nixon in 1973. Now the current commission report, the result of President Lyndon Johnson's setting up the National Advisory Commission on Violence and Civil Disorders, in July 1967, examined racial unrest in Newark, Detroit, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and other cities, and made some conclusory observations and recommendations. The committee identified three levels of intensity in the presumed target of the protesters. The first level of intensity were police practices, unemployment and underemployment, inadequate housing. The second report states, quote, in 1910, 91% of the nation's 9.8 million Negroes lived in the South, and only 27% of American Negroes lived in cities of 2,500 persons or more. Between 1910 and 1966, the total Negro population more than doubled, reaching 21.5 million, and the number living in metropolitan areas rose more than fivefold, from 2.6 million to 14.8 million. The report concludes that central cities are absorbing the overwhelming majority of the black population and states, within the cities, Negroes have been excluded from white residential areas through discriminatory practices. Just as significant is the withdrawal of white families from, or their refusal to enter, neighborhoods where Negroes are moving or already residing. The result, according to, recent, to a recent study, is that in 1960, the average segregation index for 207 of the largest United States cities was 86.2. In other words, to create an unsegregated population, an average of over 86.2% of all Negroes would have to change their place of residence within the city. Now, the current commission report on two Americas, commissioned by Lyndon Johnson, to look into the reasons for the 1967 riots, stated that, quote, white, what white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget, is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it, end quote. The report recommended the building the construction of 600,000 housing units in deprived ghetto neighborhoods. As Elizabeth Hinton states in her book, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, the commission presented three policy options. Present policy choice, number one, which would have maintained the status quo. Enrichment choice, the second option, which would have meant an investment, a large investment in separate but equal uh, maintaining the separate but equal divide, but aggressively investing to level the playing fields in terms of education and public institutions uh, on both sides. 
The third option was the integration choice. Full investment in integrating all public services, housing, suburbs, etc. And she states, quote, rather than attacking the roots of structural racism, the White House and Congress decided to, co to cope with the persistence of racial inequality by launching a punitive counter-revolution that brought to an end roughly three decades of progressive legislation. It built momentum during the second half of the 1960s and fully arrived when Johnson signed into law the Safe Streets Act of 1968. Four months after Memphis and less than a month after the uprisings in 125 cities, followed by the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In quote. As Hinton goes on to describe, quote, Carter, President Carter was the first to connect public housing conditions with crime control measures, in quote. His urban initiative's anti-crime program was inspired by the Nixon and Ford administration's embrace of defensible space, concepts developed by architect Oscar Newman. Newman believed that social science indicated higher instances of criminality in high-rise buildings with particular kinds of residents, largely black and poor. The defensible space logic and the design outputs synergize nicely with a growing interest in replacing monies going towards social policy and housing, towards investment in surveillance and other insidious technologies aimed at curbing violence in high crime areas. Urban, house, urban housing projects were controlled by private security firms, backed up by a, law, a local law enforcement presence in Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, and other cities. Yet these policies had no demonstrative effect on reducing crime. In my book chapter in 2003, titled Racial Critique of Public Housing Redevelopment Strategies, I continued the thread from Johnson, Nixon, and Carter through to the Clinton administration and their complicity in advancing the Newmanesque policies by partnering with the Congress of New Orleans. In that partnership, Henry Cisneros, then Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, who was a countrywide financial during the financial crisis, at first agrees with experts that many urban housing complexes can be redeveloped, combining an architectural renovation with an overhaul of the publicly owned landscapes surrounding it. In the case of the Robert Taylor Homes, um, three miles along the Dan Ryan Expressway um, was the site where the Robert Taylor Homes owned as all the public housing complexes were by the government. But then he reversed his course in size with the Congress of New Urbanists to link federal money with the wholesale demolishment of these public housing towers to be replaced by a sell-off of public land to private developers and a voucher program for residents to be dispersed throughout the cities in which they live. A new report from 2015 by Paul Dargowski of the Century Foundation entitled The Architecture of Segregation, found that there has been a sharp reconcentration of poverty since 2000, a trend that started well before the Great Recession. In addition, evictions, usually rare, have skyrocketed as vouchers nor, public, nor other public housing assistance has kept pace with housing demand and the high real estate and rental rates in the country's largest metropolitan areas. So the tableau from which we now gaze is riddled with failed urban development in the form of urban renewal, failed post-urban renewal in the form of housing vouchers, empowerment zones, enterprise zones, and a host of other neoliberal prescriptions for continuing prices that seems to follow black Americans wherever they reside. The black Americans' urbanism becomes a form of resistance, a form of social protest, where countercultural production eclipses cultural production as the signifier of a cohesive social community. In Harlem, Oakland, the South Bronx, and elsewhere, black cultural production thrived even in the face of brutal violence and political marginalization. 
but accounting for the density of black bodies often eclipses 